plastics are used today for a wide range of products. The processes used in their manufacture vary greatly. These goods are produced from two different kinds of plastics. These are made from thermoplastic materials, and if they're heated again, will lose their shape. These goods are made from thermosetting materials, and their shape cannot be altered by further heating. First, you'll see the methods used to process thermosetting plastics. Here is a typical thermosetting molding powder. It's free-flowing, fine powder, not dusty, and it's applied like this, ready for use. Molding is carried out in a compression press. First, the measured amount of powder is placed in the heated mold. Now the mold is closed. This particular material is urea formaldehyde and requires a temperature of 135 degrees centigrade. The powder softens and under the pressure, about two tons per square inch, it flows to fill the mold. After about 35 seconds, the chemical reaction of curing is complete. The mold is opened and the hard molding is taken out. The excess material or flash is easily removed from the edge of the molding. This method is typical of the processes used with thermosetting plastic. We now come to the processing of thermoplastic materials. These materials may be supplied in the form of granules, like this, powders, paste, or sheets. Each calls for its own processing method. The most general method used is injection molding. In this case, polythene is being used to produce a washing up bowl. Here, the molding material in the form of granules is being put in the feed hopper of a large injection machine. From the hopper, it passes into this cylinder where it's heated and becomes fluid. This machine is of special design to increase the rate of heating and to make sure the material is all at the same temperature. From the cylinder, the fluid material is forced by a plunger into a cool mold. Pressure is kept on until the plastic in the mold begins to harden. The plunger is then withdrawn and the molding removed. Here with the help of compressed air. All kinds of thermoplastic moldings are made by the injection process. And here we see combs being molded from nylon. On this machine they're being molded in pairs. Trimming is carried out by breaking off the molding from the sprue and runners at the narrow center portion. Sprues and runners are often reground and the material used again. Nearly all plastic materials contain several ingredients. Here we see a typical selection for a PVC compound. The polymer, polyvinyl chloride, is the white powder. Then we have the plasticizer, stabilizer, a lubricant, and filler, and there may be a pigment. These materials are all added to the polymer and roughly mixed by hand. Thorough mixing is carried out on a two-roll mill. One of these rollers is rotating faster than the other, and both are heated to about 160 degrees centigrade. After 10 minutes or so, the polymer swells in the plasticizer, forming a gel. In this stage, it can be removed from the mill and chopped up for injection molding machines extrusion, etc. Or it may be fed to a calendar for making thin sheet. Here we see the dolly, a rolled up sheet of plastic from the mill, being put in the calendar, which squeezes it between its rollers until it's quite thin. The rollers, called bowls, here seen from the other side, are kept hot, the lowest one being the hottest. The thin sheet travels from the cooler to the hotter bowl and is then drawn off and eventually taken up on a wooden roller. As the sheet moves along, its thickness is tested. In this laboratory, a micrometer gauge is used, but in many factories, the thickness of the sheet is automatically controlled by electronic thickness gauges. 
Polythene water pipe is made by the process of extrusion. This is a twin screw extruder set up for making one inch diameter tube. Here we see a close up of the annular die through which the polythene from the heated cylinder is forced by the action of two Archimedean screws. In the center of the die is what is known as the torpedo through which air can be blown. As the material starts to come through the die, the end of the tube is closed, pulled out thin, and hardened by cooling with a damp cloth. This is done to enable the tube to be fed into a sizing die, which consists of a water-cooled tube. This tube gives the pipe its outside dimension, for the air blown in through the torpedo forces the soft plastic tube against the wall. From the sizing die, the tube passes into a water bath, which as the extrusion gets going, is brought up as close to the die as possible. After the water bath come the traction rollers, pulling the tube along. When a sufficient length of tube has been produced, a fresh seal is made by squeezing the hot tube between the jaws of a blacksmith's tongs. A circular saw, moving along at the same speed as the pipe, then cuts through the pipe without interrupting the extrusion process. Here is an experimental setup for coating wire with policy. A crosshead has been put on the end of an extruder and a torpedo with a small hole in it used for feeding in the wire to meet the steel's plastic. Note how the coated wire is fed into the stream of hot water to give even cooling of the covering. take-up spool and electronic thickness gauges complete the setup. Leather cloth and coated fabrics are made by the spreading technique using PVC paste. The cloth is fed under a doctor knife which regulates the thickness of the coating and ensures even distribution. After coating, the cloth passes beneath infrared lamps. And then over a heated drum where the paste solidifies to a tough, resistant coating. Another use for PVC paste is seen in the making of industrial gloves. A cotton glove is first put onto a porcelain hand. Now it's dipped into the paste. Of course, on a production scale, this is carried out mechanically. This paste will again be gelled by heating, this time in an oven. When dipping is complete, the hand is withdrawn and the excess paste allowed to drain away. Then the gloved hand is cooked in the oven at a temperature of 170 degrees. After about half an hour, the hand is removed from the oven. It is cooled, and the glove slipped off, ready for service. Before thermoplastic sheet can be shaped, it has to be softened by heating. This can be done in an infrared oven. It becomes quite pliable and can then be shaped in several different ways. One of the simplest ways is with a method of free blowing. This is a steel blowing table connected to an air supply line. It's covered with a diffusing cloth to insulate the sheet and to prevent cold air impinging on the center of the shaping and so cooling that area first. After heating, the material, clear acrylic sheet in this case, is ready for blowing. The only tool necessary is a shaped clamping ring. Only very little air pressure is used and appreciable shaping takes place before any reading appears on the dial. 
For an 8-inch hemisphere, 7 or 8 pounds per square inch pressure is enough. The shaping is allowed to cool under pressure before removing the clamping ring. This method gives a shaping quite free from any mold mark. The next material illustrates the use of very simple tooling. The material is a disc of delicately tinted opaque acrylic sheet. Six pegs are so arranged that when the centre plunger is dropped, the edges of the sheet drape in natural corrugation. Only a little mould marking is shown in the angle of the base. The edges of the disc were previously polished so that no further finishing is required. Trays and shallow pressings up to four feet square and several inches deep can be made. Again, the heated acrylic sheet is clamped by a retaining ring. To minimize mold marking, a skeleton tool is used for pressing. After allowing a few minutes for the sheet to cool and harden, the tray is removed from the mold. There's only a little tool marking in the angle of the sides and the base where it's not easily seen. The excess material used in clamping is removed by cutting on a band saw. Most thermoplastic sheets can be cut on woodworking equipment, but tools and saws must be kept sharp. Acrylic sheet has no grain, so it can be turned and routed without difficulty. Now we come to more complicated shapes. These can be made by blowing into a mould. The air is introduced through that diffusing plate and the mould is vented at the top. Sharp edges to the series of rims trap an air cushion between the sheet and the mould, reducing mould marking. Considerable air pressure is used to get good shaping, and with this mould, about 50 pounds per square inch is required. After cooling, the pressure is reduced and the mould removed. The shaping is seen to be closely fitted to the mould. This compressed air pipe is applied to the air vent and a gentle pressure releases the dish. It is entirely free of mold marks on the inside. Re-entrance shapes like this can be made from acrylic sheet by a modified pressing technique. A rubber nose tool is used and the mold below has been fashioned from acrylic block. The pressure is applied to the softened sheet by means of a fly press. The clamping ring is spring-loaded to allow a little slipping of the sheet to occur at first. As more pressure is applied, the edges are firmly clamped and the rubber nose tool deforms until the cavity is filled. After the tool has been removed, the shaping is freed by splitting the mould. Most methods of shaping are equally suited to rigid PVC sheet, and this is demonstrated here. Both male and female tools are made from phenolic laminate, and a spring-loaded clamp is used, which allows a small amount of slip. This method of shaping can also incorporate a blanking tool, and articles such as photographic developing dishes may be shaped in less than 20 seconds. When mold marking cannot be tolerated on the convex side of a shaping, the vacuum snapback method is used. The 
soften sheet is stamped over an airtight box. The box is now evacuated. As the pressure is reduced, the sheet is drawn into the box in the form of bubbles. And on reaching a predetermined depth, a skeleton tool is inserted. When the vacuum is released, the hot material, still in a rubbery state, shrinks back over the skeleton. Mold marking is confined to the inside angle and is unobtrusive. Risk of tearing the sheet during pressing is avoided and the thickness variation can be controlled. A technique which is now being very widely used for shaping very thin thermoplastic sheet is vacuum forming. Instead of heating the sheet in an oven, the cold sheet is clamped in a frame and radiant heaters, there at the top, are brought in position to soften it. When sufficiently soft, the sheet is pressed over a former and then a vacuum applied to cause it to take up the exact shape required. Here we see it happening again from the top. Cooling is rapid and when the shaping is removed from the mould by air pressure, it's seen that fine details such as the wire mesh pattern surrounding the mould has been faithfully reproduced. The shaping of this lighting fitting involves the combined use of several of the techniques we've already seen. Here, a pneumatic ram press is being used in conjunction with a vacuum box. Air pressure and a spring-loaded thrust tool give carefully controlled thickness tolerances and exact form. of a blown acrylic disc cemented to the main shaping with dough cement completes this dust-proof lighting fitting which is typical of the many shapings made from thermoplastic sheets.